Well, first off, how are you doing? I am doing great. How are you? Yeah, good too. Uh, thank you so much for joining this Q&A with us. We've put out the question to our followers on social media and they had a lot of questions for you. So uh, yeah, thank you so much for taking the time. No problem. I appreciate it. Yeah. So you've worked with some of the biggest names in music and also film. Um, so it's a true honor to be collaborating with you. We'll soon be launching the Cohen Heldon Signature Series. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Um, sure. Uh, I think it's been over a year now when Black Rooster Audio first reached out to me to work on a collaboration with them. And of course, I was interested, like, let's figure out, you know, what you guys have in mind. And immediately they were like, we want to do a compressor, but we want to make it different than anything that's already out there because everybody's building compressors or emulating compressors in, in a plug-in form. So I asked them, what's the idea that you have? And they were like, what do you think about a, a Hilbert uh, transform detector? And I was like, tell me more about that. I'm not really familiar with, you know, that type of uh, detection filter. So they explained to me um, that it's most accurate compared to any other form of detection. Mm -hmm. uh, not to go completely uh, technical in that regard, but basically what it came down to is um, it analyzes a waveform. It disputes the negative phase, but only accepts the positive. And detection methods like peak or RMS, they first have to analyze the audio. It can be slightly a little bit off or a little bit late. You get overshoots. So with the Hilbert, it's very, very accurate. And you can almost, I think you can actually go completely zero uh, attack time, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. Then on top, they were like, let's, you know, do other things like uh, create filters so you can sidechain within the compressor. Uh, for the compressor to either uh, roll off high end or low end or only compress the low end or the high end. I'm like, that's perfect because the more flexibility we have, the better. And then on the coding end, they made it sound so much better. Like the compressor sounds incredibly amazing. I was surprised by it because I was like, I test compressors by the way of completely, completely going hard on them so nuke any signal that comes in to figure out how does it sound when you give it like the, the hardest possible way of compression and it just it held up really really nice yeah and it's been such a collaborative approach as well like you've been working so closely with black booster audio team so that's just awesome um, yeah, i love it they were very receptive to everything and vice versa yeah so the first question that we have for you is can you give us a short introduction into your mixing process? How do you start? How does one begin mixing a multi-platinum track? <laughs> well, it's, it's easier than people think. To me, it's always uh, simplicity is key. I hold true to the 80-20 rule or the 20-80 rule, depending on which angle you look at it. Basically meaning 80% is listening, 20% is actually putting in the work. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's, it's for us as mixers to enhance the record and make it sound better, cleaner, bigger, whatever it might be versus I'm a mixer, I need to put my ego on the record. So the way I start, I ask every client to submit, of course, first a uh, rough mix that they have because I want to first hear what I might be working with, if I'm vibing with the record. If I don't vibe with the record, it's just not the right fit for me because um, you know it, it won't translate well when you work on something that you don't like, basically. Mm -hmm. Then what I ask them to do is to submit all audio stems, so no sessions. And people always ask me why, because I want to avoid any technical issues arriving from sessions. Because with sessions, it could be that I don't have all the plugins that they have, or they have done certain routing. I have to figure out why they did the routing instead of just getting audio stems where they've already printed everything that they have on it so that I can start lining everything up. And as soon as I load it into Pro Tools, I actually have their rough mix to start from, so I don't have to reinvent the wheel. And then what I do is I start off with the, rit the rhythm section, so with the drums first, to kind of feel, um, get the beat going. It's kind of like a heart rate, like a heart, you know, beats at a certain rate, so it's, it's getting, getting the rhythm, rhythm right, and then adding the bass for the groove and seeing how that, you know, melts together and, and fuses together, and then I start working on the vocals slowly, clean them up a little bit, and see how the record kind of vibing with just kick bass, uh, snare vocal and then I start you know putting all the other elements in like whatever keyboards or guitars might be there just to you know 
get the vibe of the record going, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds like a very organic approach. And you're obviously, you know, you know what you're doing and it makes it sound like it's a lot easier than it actually is. <laughs> I know, but it's, it's with everything. It's, it's, you know, it's the same thing if you go and get your hair cut. It always looks very simple by the barber that cuts your hair. You're like, <laughs> I can totally do that. And then we try to say, like, okay, this is a lot more difficult than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I definitely never heard that analogy, but it's a good one. <laughs> Um, what is your main DA and why? Pro Tools. The reason why is because it's the industry standard. That's why Pro Tools is my, well, my main DA. Mm -hmm. um, I know there's so many other DAWs out there that actually have better, more intuitive features, but everybody in the industry still works from Pro Tools. Um, I grew up with Pro Tools. I used the window for a long time, but had to revert back to Pro Tools. Because still every once in a while you have to either you get like a vocal session in that you didn't want to have, but they were supposed to print the stems. Like I said before, mm -hmm. then it's like, okay, let my assistant figure it out and print those stems. Worst case scenario. Um, but in essence for everybody else, I'm always like, use whatever you have, what you're used to, what makes, you know, makes you work quicker, more efficient and better versus you don't have to really follow any rules, especially nowadays. Yeah, totally. And obviously you have a long history of success, but how did you first start? How did you first get into audio? I started off, uh, well, my music career when I was really young. So my parents put, I've got two older siblings. They put us through music school back in Holland, where I'm currently am because of the coronavirus. I'm stuck here until I can go back okay. to my house in LA. <laughs> um, we started out with music, uh, music school as extra curricular activity. And what, we did is, you know, you start off with the recorder, then I got more interested in, in piano and guitar. The issue with guitar was my teacher was right-handed, I'm um, left-handed. So oh, I couldn't no. figure out how to mirror what he was doing. So I kind of was like, okay, let's just switch over to, you know, piano and keyboard. I did that till I was about 12 years old. Um, that's at the point where my brother brought home some software where you could compose music on. So I started playing around with that, started making some productions, uh, starting reaching out to record labels, to DJs, because was, I was doing EDM back in the day. And I had some responses back, uh, led eventually to a publishing deal when I was 14 years old. Wow. And the main thing that I always got back from that was my publisher always told me, your mixes sound terrible. <laughs> so I started figuring out how can I make my mixes better? And it's almost like an OCD thing where it was like, I got to make those mixes just better, whatever it takes. And started trying to figure it out. Um, started reading online, like interviews with, with magazines and, and just researching forums to see what people were saying, talking to, of course, uh, other DJs uh, and asked them like, how are you mixing? How are you creating this sound? Mm -hmm. Which eventually led to me reading an interview. I think one of the very first interviews with David Pensado. And he left this email address at the bottom of the article stating, hey, if anybody has something interesting that, uh, that I can pick my brain about, please email me and, uh, you know, let me know. And I think I wrote like so many emails before I got one response back. Mm -hmm. Finally, when I got the one response back, I'm like, okay, now I got my foot in the door. And that's when I started building a relationship with him. And he basically mentored me without me being ever an assistant or being one-on-one -on -one in the studio with him. So I learned a tremendous amount of information from him. And during that time as well, I started doing internships on the weekend, first at the local radio station down here in Holland, which then translated to meeting somebody that did live sound, started assisting live sound, building, helping building the stages, tearing down the stages. But he also had a recording studio. So he was like, I know that you want to, get more involved with the studio live. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get you in as like the assistant engineer to my engineer. So you can start picking up some of the know-how, the techniques and the etiquettes and all of that. Did that for a minute. Then I started applying for uh, a job at a studio also in Holland that just opened up way too ambitious. They built a studio back in, um, in the old Heineken factory, the brewery in the basement. They hired this, uh, New York company that all, did all the big studios in the US. They got the very first Neve 88 RS console. And I think they spent almost up to like a million euros back then to just build a studio and get it going, which is way too ambitious for a small country like Holland. 
So they won belly up, I think, in six or nine months. But during that time, I met other, you know, international artists because when they would perform, they were always making sure like, okay, we got to get them to our studio. Uh, met some people from the Diddy crew, from Bad Boy. Um, did some engineering for them. And of course, they were like, hey, can you also get, you know, let us leave for the rough mix. They started liking the rough mixes. And then from there, it kind of built my whole career and started making the move slowly to the U.S. Wow, that is so impressive. <laughs> Well done on that. Thank um, you. So yeah, you'll notice a lot of a lot of these questions are around, you know, how did you make it, and and you know that's what people want to know. Um, and so you've kind of touched on this, but how did the bigger artists get to know you? How does does one get to where you are today? Right, it's all word of mouth. So it's uh, in in New York. The I got really lucky because through. Some of the Diddy guys, I met Joel Santana, who back then was a very good friend of Lil Wayne. So automatically there, people start talking about, hey, I got this kid. Um, you know, maybe he's cool to help your people out or assist with that. Or, you know, he might be doing this and start doing a bunch of free work for a bunch of people. I was like, I just want to show them my craft. I want to show them that I'm hungry, that I just, you know, basically team no sleep. Just keep going, keep going, keep going. And eventually... You know, the more people know about your of you, the better it is because, and especially in a good sense of the word. So yeah. don't go out there and create a rampage. And, <laughs> you know, don't want to get that happening. So slowly but surely, it's it's like your work gets out there. So they start hearing the quality, and then at the same time, artists and label people will talk to other people, and your name will come up, and they're like, "Oh yeah, I, I know this guy," or "I've heard of him." let's, you know, try him out on this or hire him for that. And slowly but surely you start building that resume up. Yeah. Wow. Um, so what is a typical day in the studio? Like, how do you start your day? How does it progress? I usually try to do a workout before I start my day. Mm -hmm. Then after workout, um, I just see if it's something that I need to do some recalls on. So it might be like that they want to have the snare a little louder or try to be creative with adding some drop somewhere or you know turning the vocal down or up um once i have those out of the way there's usually a new mix that needs to happen so i'll just listen to the rough mix load in all the audio files color code everything and kind of vibe with the record get an idea of what they have as a sound and what i think it should what they're aiming for what it should become and then they slowly start working on it and then i do every Every hour I take about five minute break just to refresh your ears because mm -hmm. you get so much ear fatigue real quick about listening to something over and over. So it becomes sounding normal and the norm for you instead of, you know, getting that right balance in there where you're like, okay, I just completely went, went over, over the top with that. I should, you know, bring it back a little bit. And then every four hours I take um, at least an hour break to completely, you know, decompress from everything maybe um, eat something and then I jump back in it. And then I work about eight to 10 hours, just depending on how busy a day might be. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you do, do you do pretty late nights, like classic audio? Classic no, that's, that's, that's <laughs> late nights don't really happen for me. The, the beauty about that is because I'm not on the creative part. Mm -hmm. So I hardly deal directly with the artist or the producer. Usually it's just, you know, mix gets done, it gets sent out to them, they listen to it, I get feedback back. Mm -hmm. Every once in a while, uh, a producer or an artist wants to come through, but the beautiful thing is, they won't come through before 4 p.m. Mm -hmm. So you already know that by, if you start, because I usually, I wake up around 8, 9 in the morning, do my workout and everything, and then I slowly start working on the mix around noon. So by 4 p.m., if somebody wants to come through between 4 and 6 when they come through, there's already... The mix is already pretty much standing. So a, a good first draft of what needs to be there is there. So we can slowly start cleaning more and, you know, working whatever the artist wants to do on the record while being present versus having to, you know, set up the whole session while they're there. Mm -hmm. it's just, uh, yeah, I like it better that way to start early because then you kind of beat the odds, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's interesting that you have such a structured day and that you take time for breaks because, I mean, that is so important. But I feel like a lot of audio engineers don't really do that. Yeah, yeah and especially if, you, if you're only recording that you're tied in with the schedule of the artist, which could easily mean that you're, 
your day was supposed supposed to start at like 4 p.m but they won't show up until like 10 p.m so you're just sitting there and waiting and waiting mm -hmm. so i love to be productive from moment number one quick turnaround get things done easy and quick and you know make the process as smooth as possible yeah love that um, so this is a very expected question because you're obviously very known for your work with XXX Tentacion. Um, what was the creative process like working with him? If you want to expand, divulge a little bit. Yeah, the, working with, with XXX Tentacion was pretty cool because what happened is um, the way he used to work is he used to record a song but don't, don't pretty much live with the, with the rough mix to not really get demo-itis. Mm -hmm. So he would record the song, and as soon as he had laid down his vocals and was satisfied with them, it would automatically send everything my way. So pretty much the first thing you would really hear that day was a final mix. Because mm -hmm. a lot of times what happens is artists live with their rough mix maybe for months, especially if they have to deal with a label. The label might sit on some records for some months trying to figure out how to compile the right album together. And then records get sent out for mixing and then you mix the record and because it's going to sound slightly different and you know and the artist has heard it for let's say six months any little difference is going to make such a huge impact on them that they're like i'm so used to hearing it this way now i'm hearing it the other way i don't really know if i like the other way so he tried to avoid that by okay i love what my i love my vocals how they sound right now let's send everything out let's get a first mix draft out there and let's just build off that mix yeah wow i mean it's it's crazy that you got to work with all of these huge artists and i think you know that's why we got all of these questions in because people are just you know they want to know how you how you became you basically <laughs> um so what is your a little bit about your studio what is your monitoring setup like and why so i got a studio at my house in la and of course it's acoustic acoustically treated um, I'm using a Raven a Slate Raven desk, basically just to get out of the way of you know having to touch the mouse 24/7 and you know avoiding any injuries, any health problems. Mm -hmm. uh, and then my monitoring has been HS fives and HS eight, but they're all tuned according to the room. Mm -hmm. So I have a room EQ. I use uh, Sonarworks for that. And the reason why everybody always asks why do I have HS fives and eights? The thing is, I grew up with NS tens. So I'm really used to like listening to basically a speaker that just doesn't sound good at all. And the, the main thing was always, if you can make it sound good on NS10s, it will sound good anywhere. So I'm just used to that kind of Yamaha NS10 sound. So I kind of evolved from that because of course they stopped producing them. Another brand now is kind of making knockoff version of them. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't heard those, so I can't judge on, judge on those, but I evolved with that. They came out with the HS series, uh, started buying them. And it's, it's basically something I'm used to hearing that speaker. And I know the speaker, uh, although they're tuned nowadays, so it was kind of getting used to like, okay, now they sound different. <laughs> now they sound a lot more duller than I expected. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, as, as far as speakers go, I always tell people, learn your speaker, know what it sounds like and learn your room. Because I can tell you like, oh, you, you know, I use these, go buy those. But you might not even know the speakers and how they sound. And then before you know, you're like, why doesn't anything sound good anywhere else? Mm -hmm. But it sounded good on the speakers. But yeah. that's my main advice for that. So you're avoiding the shock factor when you go into another environment. And it's just like... Exactly. I've had those a lot <laughs> during my earlier days in the career. I'm like, oh, my God, why is this so hard? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't do that. Um, <laughs> Sounds wrong yeah. with your system. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, so what is the main difference, would you say, between the KH Comp 1, your signature compressor, and other compressors in your arsenal? It's very, very flexible. The KH 1 is very, very flexible. It sounds so good. Because mm -hmm. it's one thing that I always, what I dislike a lot about compressors, especially plug-in-wise, they can really take a hard beating when it comes to compression. They start, it's almost like starting to sound like a vacuum. Mm -hmm. I don't like that vacuum type squeezing sound. And as soon as I, as I got a first working beta of the, ver of the cage comp one, I was like, I'm just going to compress something extremely hard and see how it holds up. And it held up very, very well. Mm -hmm. And it gave it some, somewhat of a, like a low mid 
kind of boom. So it brought out a lot of the body of the instrument as well. So I was immediately like, yes, this is what I want to have. And then we have flexibility, like I said before, the Hilbert uh, transform, mm -hmm. which allows us pretty much a zero point attack time, which is amazing for side chaining things like kick and bass or even de vocals or removing a harsh frequency. Um, Cause we also have like flexibility with the filters. There's a whole filter section in there for the low end, the high end, you can inverse them. So there's so much flexibility even on that end. And then auto detector modes, like outside of the Hilbert, we have like the traditional peak and RMS months and we have a peak vintage, which basically adds in some distortion harmonics and non-linearities, which I love. Cause I just love the, non-clean sound of things i always like to add a little bit of dirt to them mm -hmm. and you know it's it's even with the ratios you have uh all the ratios from soft compression to heart limiting knees knee ratios between that the knee type to go from heart knee to soft knee or leave it anywhere in between so there's so many flexible options that we have to use compression wise plus it sounds so incredibly good mm -hmm. i'm like this is definitely a beast that competes but even stands out from the rest of the crowd because it's so much functionality yeah and it was such a, uni a unique opportunity for black booster audio as well to create a compressor that is up to your standards you know yes the industry standard right because i'm always yelling I'm like hey i need a better compressor i'm missing <laughs> this or whatever it might be and it was like oh, okay let's do this I'm like okay this is exciting yeah yeah exactly um so on that why did you want to use the hilbert detector You've kind of touched on this already, but this is a particular question. That you yeah, have. it's it's because it's, it's so diverse. It's, it can use pretty much in anything. Mm -hmm. uh, but let's start with the Hilbert transform, that detector. Like I said, if you working with a kick and a bass, um, I never like to sidechain kick and bass wideband. I always want to select anything below 90 hertz to get compressed whenever the kick comes in, because that way you don't get that pumping feeling on the bass and the kick. Um, so it's ideal to just inverse that filter to 90 hertz and make sure that the compressor only hits and compresses 90 hertz and below whenever the kick comes in or even high end, remove some harshness like de or moving some harsh frequencies from hi-hats. So you can do the same thing, but on the opposite end of the spectrum. Um, peak compression, kind of like add some snap to like percussion sounds or RMS to level out vocals more. So we got that too, um, or the vintage version, the vintage peak uh, detector where I might be like, okay, this sounds a little bit too digitally clean. Let's add some uh, non-linearity. So we use that detector. Um, yeah, it's, it's so, so many wide applications you can use for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an absolute beast to compress it. It's amazing. It totally is. Um, so back to you, which tips do you wish you knew when you started mixing? The tips I wish I had when I started mixing, which I only learned way later in my career is go by feel. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to look right as long as it sounds right and it sounds good. And not everything has to sound good as long as it just sounds new. Cause you always want to push the envelope cause we can hear a record that sounds exactly like a previous record and we can hear a record that might not sound as good, but it sounds interesting because things sound different. Mm -hmm. So it's moving by feel versus technically I supposed to do this or that. It's like, nah, does this feel right? Okay. Then it's right. Basically. Yeah. I guess it's so easy to get caught up in all the technical aspects and, you know, getting distracted by all the visual elements and just forgetting to, to listen. Yes. Especially nowadays. Yeah, exactly. computer screens, everything is in front of us versus just close your eyes and just that's another thing for the Raven. I'm like, I can I can hold down a value of something that I'm using and pretty much close my eyes and move it a little bit and be like, okay, does this improve or does this take away from the record mm -hmm. versus I'm looking at it. Okay, this this number should end up on here where it's like, no, nah, it's, it's not a numbers game. Yeah. No, that's, that's really good advice, actually. So thank you for that. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, do you have any reference tracks that you like using and which musical genres, uh, this is kind of a all-in-one question, but which musical genres do you refer back to uh, as a hip-hop mixer, producer? Usually what I do, it sounds so cliche-ish, but I always have Spotify open on the Rap Caviar playlist. Mm -hmm. If I 
that is if I'm doing like urban records and just listen, I go through that playlist. So just trying to see like, okay, why are these on the playlist? And on top of that, I also switch back to the Spotify top 50 US and see, okay, which urban records are charting and then which ones are the highest charting and then compare them compare those against what's in the rap caviar playlist and then combine those two and compare those to what I'm working with. Okay. So that way you can go like, okay, sonically now it's more of a trend of let's say more duller records or brighter records or vocals extremely loud or vocals less loud or the kick that's poking out pretty much a little too loud, but it's, it's a trend. So that way you can kind of reference against what is the norm or what people tend to like to listen to and at the same time figuring out okay what will be the trend let's say three months from now six months from now a year from now because we never really know if we mix a record today if that record is going to come out next week next month three months from now six months from now even a year from now because the worst thing you want to have happening is a record that comes out a year from now that you mix today to today's standards and then who knows where it might be sound wise a year from now then you hear it back like, oh, I wish I could just touch up on that record. Yeah. I guess it's down to experience because how the hell do you predict? How? You, you yeah. really don't. It's, it's, it's almost like intuition of like, I think it should be going there, mm -hmm. which comes back to that whole thing of sometimes it's better to sound new than mm -hmm. to sound good in that sense. Yeah. Everyone's going to want that playlist now. It's a magic playlist. <laughs> I was going to left caviar and Spotify so fast. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, thank you so much for all the answers. We no went problem. through a lot of questions, so thank you. And my uh, pleasure. The KH Comp One is going to come out really soon. We're very excited, so stay tuned. Sign up to our email list. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot. No problem. Thank you, guys. Bye. <laughs> bye bye.